Curiosity is the best engine for learning. Once I was giving a talk at, at a place where there are a lot of IBM employees and a, a man, actually, by the way, also from India, came up to me and said, well, isn't the most important thing is to learn how to be an autodidact, teach yourself something new. It feels kind of good to be hungry when you know you're gonna get food, and it feels kind of good not to know something if you know you're gonna be able to find it out. Um, and that feeling, which is very visceral, you must know it, I can tell just by the fact that you do this podcast and everything, and I know it, and lots of people, a lot of scientists know that feeling, it's so exciting. To going to get the answer to your question. As you said, different people have different curiosity and the best way to teach them is to use that curiosity. And if each person has different curiosity and we systemize education to give like one size fit for all, that is a really big challenging big question too. It's a big mistake. I mean, that's the trouble. Um, it's we, we throw out children's urge to learn. And then we wonder why so many kids are disinterested in school or drop out. Good day, everyone. Uh, today we have someone, uh, let me see, how do I introduce her? She has done or worked on the better part of her life on a rather interesting aspect of human psychology that is curiosity. She has authored over six books, which I found really interesting. And she is the director of teaching at Williamson's College, Massachusetts, and practices developmental psychology. Susan, welcome to The Truman Show. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. Are we all children at heart? Are you still yeah. a child at heart? Because oh. you're immensely curious, <laughs> and we're all curious. And as we grow up, the curiosity tends to slow down if we did not mindfully practice it and you've been curious throughout your life. Are we or are you still a child at heart? That's a nice question. Uh, but sadly, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a developmental psychologist, as you said, and mm -hmm. actually I teach at Williams College. It's called Williams College. Oh. Um, and... Uh, you know, people like me who do research about early development, we think that the thing that's so fascinating about young children is that they're qualitatively different from grown-ups. It's not just mm -hmm. that they're smaller or that they know less or that they have fewer skills. They actually see the world differently than we do. Um, and uh, in general, I mean, it's a great question, actually, because in general, the ways that we change, the ways that we develop help us do all the things we do. They help you be an engineer. They help me do research, um, build a family, make friends, have political views. Um, so anybody listening to your show who's a parent knows that what you want most in the world is for your young child to develop, to keep changing the way they think so that they become more adult-like because in many ways the, the mind of an adult is more powerful, more capable, more knowledgeable than that of a young child. However, you are right that there's one way in which young, there are quite a few ways, but one of the ways in which young children have a great advantage over people like me, um, I'm old, uh, is that their curiosity is unbounded um, and they are omnivorous mm -hmm. in their appetite for information and new knowledge. And you are right that that wanes, that diminishes to a great degree over the course of, you know, but after about the age of five, four or five, it begins to diminish. And for some people, it diminishes quite dramatically. But even for people like me, I'm a pretty curious person. I'm a scientist. I'm a scholar. So I like to learn new things. I like to think about things and find things out. But even for me, um, I'm not curious about everything the way I was when I was two. I'm curious about some things. And that's true of even the most curious adult. Um, you couldn't function as an adult if you had the curiosity of a two-year-old. But there's, and, and that's a good thing. Like we become more selective and we become narrower but deeper in our curiosity. On the other hand, we're not 
children at heart. We don't have that kind of unbridled enthusiasm for every new experience that the two or three year old has. And I don't know, is that sad? No, because we get other things in, in exchange for that. Is that because of the environment? Is the environment that uh, kills it in some manner? Or if, if, if conditions were favorable, would we still be curious at that level? I was just uh, curious. Yes and no. So, yes, my research and, and the work in, in my book, The Hungry Mind, and the book after it, The Intellectual Lives of Children, very much documents uh, research. Some of it's my research, but a lot of it's not. It's the research of other people documents the fact that as children get older, they're, like I said, your curiosity has to slow down a little bit. So curiosity is a response to novelty. It's the urge mm -hmm. to understand what's new or unexpected. So when you're two or three, almost everything's unexpected. There's so much you encounter in everyday life that's brand new to you. So of course you have to put it in your mouth or rattle it or open it up or ask 30 questions about it in 15 minutes because you're gobbling up the world. Um, and as you get older, less of everyday life is a surprise because you get more accustomed to the routines that, that govern everyday life and you develop categories. So every dog is in a brand new experience. You understand there's something called dogs and you understand something about the way dogs behave, so you're not going to be dumbfounded every time you encounter a dog. So in that sense, curiosity dwindles just as a function of cognitive growth, uh, of kids learning more about the world and becoming more accustomed to the things around them. And yet you're right, curiosity diminishes in part because of the environment. So we needn't become as incurious as most people become. That's a function, I think, and my research suggests, as does the research of other people. We needn't become as incurious as most people become. Or a nicer way to put that is, if we, if we did different things differently for young children and, and middle age, you know, older children in schools and in their home lives, more people would stay more curious as they get older than they currently do. Mm. Is that uh, how? Yeah, is, is is there a reason why we as adults, when we grow up, we lose that curiosity? It, yes. Um, so one reason, at least in the United States, which is where I live, um, but I think this is true in many schools, in many cultures, even some unschooled cultures, um, or cultures without formal schooling, let's say. Uh, but certainly in the United States, there's such an emphasis in schools on acquiring certain skills and certain knowledge that there's very little room for pursuing what really interests you. And it's hard to be curious about the thing that doesn't interest you. So if you asked me to be curious about cars, I would have a very hard time summoning up much curiosity. It just doesn't interest me at all. But show me a new kind of cooking. I happen to love cooking, so I use that as an example. Or show me a new kind of creature, because I love the outdoors. Show me a new kind of sunset. Or let me not be so romantic and pastoral. Show me something that really matters to me, like right now, the conflict in the Middle East. My first reaction was to try to learn more about the things I didn't understand. Um, and I'm deliberately picking something that's loaded and scary and unpleasant and painful for many, many people because often what we're curious about is not a sunset or a cute animal. It's something disturbing or worrisome or, and, or dark, mysterious. And often, if you're lucky, that makes you curious. You want to find out more. Uh, it helps you get your mind around whatever you're trying to um, understand. But our school system pushes against that because instead of saying, what is this kid interested in? What makes them curious? What? How can I help them learn to pursue their curiosity? Um, 
we say there's no time for that now. You have to learn the stuff I decided you have to learn, and you have to learn it in the way that I told you you have to learn it. And there's nothing wrong with some of that. We have to teach kids certain things. Um, but the extent to which we shut out what children are actually thinking about in order to get them to think the things we want them to think, that really depresses curiosity, which is a disaster. It's not just that that's not, not that it's not a matter of sentiment or, oh, it's how, you know, sad for kids they can't study the things they like. Curiosity is the best engine for learning. So if you look at a population of kids and you think to yourself, how can I make these kids wonderful learners, really excellent learners, which is what every school wants and every parent wants, uh, the single best tool at your disposal is the kid's curiosity, is their hunger for information and their, their drive. It's a biological drive to reduce uncertainty and to explain the unexpected. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, you know, uh, what does my mother call that expression? We're spitting in our own soup by uh, <laughs> limiting their uh, chance to pursue the things that make them curious because we're also throwing out the tool that helps people become good learners. Maybe, maybe it's the conditions that we are brought up in, right? Like, I like cars, you like cooking, <laughs> and which makes it really difficult because... Right now, we are living in an industrial era where we want to systemize the heck out of everything. And when we systemize things, there is no personal interest that's being, uh, I don't know, personal interest that's given importance. So as you said, different people have different curiosity. And the best way to teach them is to use that curiosity. And if each person has different curiosity and we systemize education to give like one size fit for all, that is a really big challenging big question too. It's a big mistake. I mean, that's the trouble. Um, it's we, we throw out children's urge to learn and then we wonder why so many kids are disinterested in school or drop out or learn very little. I mean, you can go through the motions at school, at least in the United States, you can do what's asked of you and pass and do okay. But, you know, when I used to give a lot of talks on curiosity all over the world, people would come up to me and actually, um, did you say that you grew up in India? Yes. The person I, I remember best, I was actually in Singapore giving a talk, but a, a man from India came up to me. He was a professor. And he said, and, you know, my research is about kids, like kids from the ages of like three to eight. And he said to me, is there a critical period after which it's too late? Like, can 18-year-olds can become curious? And um, at first I thought he was sort of mad at me for my research. And then I realized he was desperate for the answer because he was a college professor. And he was struggling with how incurious his college students were. And we don't know the answer to his question. We don't know if you can take a, an incurious or intellectually deadened 18-year-old and bring them to life intellectually and help them become curious. That research hasn't been done that shows whether there's sort of a critical period for fostering curiosity. Uh, I, I think I remember this quote. I think it was said by Neil deGrasse Tyson. He said that um, children come out of schools as though they have done chores. That's a and great expression. Yeah, and I, I think that itself says a lot about our system. Uh, is there any evidence that says that uh, children who doesn't go to school, uh, they have more curiosity throughout their lifetime? No, because uh, for a very reasonable, um, you said you're an engineer, right? So you have a good mind for yeah. science. Uh, for a very reasonable scientific um, there's a very reasonable scientific explanation for why we don't have that research, which is, by and large, at least in the industrialized world, um, kids who don't go to school, there are reasons why they're not going to school in terms of adversity or poverty or illness or lack of access or being sort of cut out of society in some way or another by forces outside of their control. So it's very hard to know if they seem... You wouldn't know whether their extra curiosity or more likely their lack of curiosity, that would be my guess, is because of 
something about school versus not school or whether it has to do with the underlying reasons why they weren't in school. Now, it'd be fun to do a uh, a study. I don't think this has been... Uh, maybe it has, actually. So in my lab, some of my students did research showing... It's not quite about curiosity. It was really about invention. But it had to do with the idea that children can only be as inventive as the stuff they know about. So you might predict that if you're trying to see, as many researchers have, whether a kid can invent a little hook to lift something out of a test tube, and all the research shows that four-year-olds can't do that and, and six-year-olds can, but we reasoned that maybe it has to do with whether you grew up around fishing or not. And actually some research has been done to show that kids who grow up in fishing villages who may not have gone to school and they may not have all the sort of typical academic skills of school children, but because they know something about fishing, they're slightly better at inventing a fish hook. But so I was going to say before, um, you, you, it might be fun to look at cultures where a lack of schooling is not associated with adversity or struggles. It's just that no one goes to school you might see if those kids rate higher in general on certain curiosity measures than kids of their age who went to school in another culture. It's just that it's so hard. It's like comparing apples and oranges because there's so much else that's <laughs> yeah. different about those kinds of cultures. So I can't I answer your question. <laughs> we look, yeah, I can about... answer it a different way. Um, we, in a beautiful study that I uh, describe in, now in two of my books and may describe it in another book because it was so fabulous, um, two researchers, long before there were things like iPhones, they put little vests on little kids at home, like three-year-olds, and um, the vests had a little mic microphone sewed into them. This mm -hmm. was ancient times. And they recorded everything those little kids said at home. And one of the things they counted was how many questions those kids asked at home. These kids were in England, in, in sort of working class industrial England in, in the 80s, 1980s. And um, the kids asked a zillion questions. Like even the most talkative, inquisitive kids asked something like, oh, God, I'm going to forget the number right now. But it was like two questions a minute. Um, and even the least curious children, like the most quiet or shy or inhibited, asked something like a question every two minutes. So, you know, if anybody's a parent in your audience, they, they can imagine what that's like to have a two-year-old who's asking you a question every two minutes. It means the least inquisitive kid is asking 30 questions an hour. Um, so these researchers left those vests on the kids when the kids finally started school. And once the kids got to school, they asked more like four questions an hour. So that's a drop mm. from an average of somewhere about 70 questions an hour to four questions an hour. And that's the impact of school. And, you know, people might say, well, what do you expect? There's only one teacher with 23 kids or whatever it is. I don't expect anything different except... That the fact is, if you can't ask as many questions or get as many responses to those questions, it's going to have an impact on your curiosity. I was a teacher. I, I teach a bit. I used to teach a bit. I, I, I would say I'll correct myself. I, I used to teach a bit back in college, one-on-one uh -huh. -on -one teaching. Mm -hmm. And I understood that I, I fill the gaps or I only realize where I don't know stuff once I teach. The best way to learn is to teach. I figured out in by practicing that way and uh, how can a person be a good teacher or so in that sense is a teacher and a student the same oh my goodness that's a big question well i would put it a little differently because i think there are a lot of ways to learn something one way is to try to teach it another way is if you want to build something or understand something or create something if you're very motivated to solve a problem you're you're motivated to learn for it but I do agree with you that the best test of someone's knowledge is their ability to teach it to somebody else. Um, mm. Because you really can't teach something well to somebody else if you don't really know it yourself. Uh, so it may sometimes lead people to learn, but I think there are other ways. There are other sort of 
causes for learning, but it's certainly one of the best ways to figure out if you do know something or not. And you're right. If you go to t every teacher has had this terrible moment, including myself, where you get up to teach something, let's say you're lecturing or leading a discussion, and you thought you understood the material you wanted to share with the students or the concept or the process or skill or whatever, and then you're like, oh, holy cow, I don't really know it. And it's a great way to find out what you do and don't know is to try to teach it. Is ignorance bliss? Uh, probably. I mean, I don't know. It depends. There are some things that I read in the paper every day that I wish I hadn't read and I wish I didn't know. I would be happier if I, I didn't know them. But we'd be sunk as a society if we didn't, if we didn't love knowledge. Um, But the, that's something that goes against curiosity, right? It's it it tells. I mean, I I I've I've seen this. People say a lot of the time, saying that uh, after a point, it's like it's better to not not know stuff. And yeah. I had one guest in one of my other episodes. He used to say, "Nothing ever gets better by not paying attention." Well, it depends on better for whom. So. If you pass someone on the street who's struggling and their struggle is very painful to you, something terrible has happened to them, you're happier if you don't look. But they're happier if you do look and then feel compelled to help them. And given mm -hmm. what's going on in the world, I mean, you know, think about, well, think about, I'm trying to think of a relevant example. I mean, think about the, I don't know where you live in Canada, but think about the fires that happened in Canada this year. Was that anywhere near you? Yeah, no, no, not really. Okay. Well, you know, it's. I wished I didn't know about all those terrible fires, and they affected me where I live. The air was heavy with smoke, and my little baby grandson was had to be kept inside and stuff like that. But somebody has to know about it so we can begin to figure out how to deal with the increasing number of events like that that there will be. In, in a world where there's global warming and changing conditions on earth um so ignorant so your your guest who said nothing ever got better by not paying attention he i agree with that guest the world won't get better by not paying attention but bliss is a very individual concept i might be i might sleep better tonight if i don't read the news before i go to bed mm -hmm. but The world won't be better off if everybody just turns away from what's happening. Um, and you know, I, guess, look, I mean, yeah. I, I just want to say that the for some people, some people respond to bad things by wanting to shut down, but not all of us do. For me, when something bad happens, my, I have it's not better or worse. It's just who I am. I have to know more. I, I feel that finding out more will help me think about it and that thinking about it might lead to good action and that will make me feel better. So but that's just very personal. Mm -hmm. Are there some ways in which we can practice to, you know, develop curiosity oh. that you mean extend it to our adulthood? Yes, that's a nice question. Oh, well, I love what your guest said about paying attention. Starts with noticing things mm -hmm. so that you notice what's mm -hmm. unexpected and what isn't. You have to be alive to the world um, in order to notice what you what's surprising. And you have to be surprised or do, you have to know when you're encountering the unexpected in order to feel curious. Um, so it starts with paying attention. Um, and I think it also... I'll say two more things about that. You you have to be a, a little bit, how will I say this without using technical terms, which will be meaningless. You have to be, I wouldn't say you have to seek risk, but if you're mm -hmm. too risk averse, and, and we know this from research, if you're too, I mean, we do, there's research like this with mice and rats. If, if they're too scared, they don't explore their environments, mice and rats, in research on, on, on curiosity. And the same is true of people. If, you're too, if everything terrifies you, you're not going to explore at all. And I'm a kind of timid person, and I'm a kind of anxious person, but I guess I'm lucky. I'm not intellectually anxious. I'm, like, scared of, I don't know, steep mountains and 
airplanes and stuff, but I'm not scared of conversations and I'm not scared of knowledge and I'm not scared of new ideas. And so to be curious, whether it's about intellectual matters or the physical world or cooking or cars, um, you have to be comfortable not knowing things, but not, not, you can't sit with that. My son, my youngest son is a biologist. And I once said, maybe a good definition of curiosity is that you embrace not knowing. And he said, no, mom, people like us love knowledge. You don't want people just to embrace not knowing. You want them to embrace the prospect of knowing what they don't yet know. Um, it has to feel good to you to think, oh, I don't know this now, but I will know it. So to the extent that you can cultivate that and cultivate, I mean, I've been thinking a lot in the last two weeks about how important it is to cultivate open-mindedness and how hard it is to oh, do. Yeah. To say, is there a completely different way of thinking about this? Like, What if the people who totally disagree with me are right? What would it take for them to be right? And what would it take for me to be wrong? Even if you go right back to your original idea, it's valuable to go through that process. Mm -hmm. So uh, in more or less, be more fearless. Is that what you mean? Yes. Into, that's great. I love that word. Intellectually fearless. Because at heart, I don't mean intellectual in some snobby, scholarly way. I don't mean academics. Intellectual means just you're using your mind. And after all, curiosity is a mental process. So um, your hand can't pick up the fascinating little bug or inspect the interesting algae or be interested in another human being. I mean, gossip is a great form of curiosity and one that I deeply love myself. Mm -hmm. You can't engage in those kinds of curiosity that are very non-academic. They're not fancy. They're not lofty. Um, but you can't engage in them if your mind isn't curious. So it's a mental activity. So yes, mentally fearless, a little bit mentally fearless, not so fearless that you, you know, you throw caution to the winds, but you dare to, to learn what you don't know, to, um, identify what you don't know and to think about things in a different way than you already do. Hmm. This is how. I picture curiosity in my head. When you're born, you are you have nothing. You are zero and you don't have any programs to run in this world. <laughs> and you absorb everything like a sponge. So you have that base program. Like we can think, maybe we can think of it as the first windows that came out back in the time. And <laughs> then slowly all you get are updates. Uh, the first major is like a big OS change. You get the big interactive, uh, interactive screen or whatever. And then everything comes in small updates, but your the updates make your life better, but uh, it would be better with, if everybody updated. <laughs> it's great. I mean, my son keeps talking about updating his priors. And at first I had mm -hmm. no idea what he's talking about, but I guess that comes from Bayesian um, modeling. Mm -hmm. And I think it's what you're talking about. You have an expectation and then new information comes in and you have to go back and redo that original expectation. So if you think sunsets are always orange and then you see a pink sunset, you're like, oh, they're not always orange. Or you could think if you did, weren't willing to update, you'd think, nope, that's not a sunset because it's not orange. Um, and, you know, that sounds ridiculous when I say that, but people do that all the time. Uh, they reject incoming information because it doesn't fit what they already thought. Mm, again, is that our cognitive biases that hinder or is it our ego or well, I don't know, I don't know. Is, it, is it because it, it, it hurts our identity because we yes. because religion is a really central aspect of their lives of some people. And if somebody says something oppo in opposition to it, it really hurts their sentiment. Well, so Ezra Klein wrote a book called Why We Are Polarized. And the reason I keep bringing up politics is not because I want to talk about politics. I do not. But because I really don't want people to think that people like me who are interested in curiosity, that is just some sentimental fluff about early childhood, how cute little kids are. Um, I think it, that curiosity is essential to human 
flourishing and survival. And his example, to your point, is about the way in which people's identity is so central to how they operate and how they think and how they function in the world that they often choose what to believe politically. You were talking about religion, but it's the same of politics. The polit- the, polit- the things people say, the information they get, the choices they make, whether when they're voting or in any other setting that affect politics or are related to politics, all have to do with what confirms their identity. And what, you know, so if, if someone feels like you, if you think, oh, that's my kind of person, I'm like them, then I'll believe what they believe and I'll accept what they say and I'll vote the way they vote and I'll choose them. And if someone seems not like you, they don't share your identity, you tune it out. And I think that's very close to what you're talking about, um, which is what makes us closed to curiosity. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the reason honestly, I brought that up is because it kills open-mindedness. Exactly. Exactly. They're very closely related because if you're curious enough, you want to know about things that even, I mean, look, any good scientist has to be open to the possibility that they'll get results in their lab and their experiment that disconfirm their earlier hypothesis. You want to talk about priors. That's a updating, um, that you have, you know, if the best scientists are the ones not who whose research always proves their original hypothesis, but who do mm-hmm. beautiful experiments that might sometimes lead to a surprise, um, and and might who can force play them. around. Yes, well, who can play around and who can be bold enough to change their mind about something and say, "Well, the data were good. It was my hypothesis that was bad." That hmm. takes courage, intellectual courage. Talk to me a little bit about your school. Well, I ha- I was a co-founder of a school. Is that what you mean? I read that it was an experimental school. Yes, yes. So we're talking about the same thing. So it was a long time ago. I think it was like 25 years ago. I was part of a group of people mm-hmm. who wanted to start a new kind of school. Um, and uh, they asked me to be sort of the educational guide for it. So I sort of developed the curriculum and thought of how things would work and what kids would be doing and how teachers would function. And I worked with that school for, oh, 19 years. Um, and it was a little crazy because it was about five hours away from where I live. But I'd go out once a month and I'd work with the faculty and I'd watch them all teach and I'd give them feedback and I'd help them design curricula and plan what to do and what not to do. Um, it was very, in the early days, it very much embodied the things I think are really important for young kids. It it focused less on certain subject matters and more on encouraging kids to be thinkers. And it gave, I mean, it's a whole other podcast about teachers and, <laughs> and what should happen with teachers. But I think that very often what schools do is get in the way of good teachers in their effort to protect everybody from bad teachers, they prevent good teachers from doing what they do really well. So I had this idea because we had a lot of freedom and it was a very small school that you should pick really good teachers and then create the conditions that allowed them to do good things with kids. And we had a list of, I don't remember, it was about eight things that we wanted kids to be doing every day. So we wanted them to be reading. We wanted them to be having long conversations about things that interested them. We wanted them to be working with numbers. We wanted them to be making things. We wanted them to be collaborating. We wanted them to think about what's beautiful and what's not. Um, And there were a few others. Oh, we wanted them to be scientists. That's very near and dear to my heart. Um, But we gave teachers a lot of freedom for how to do those things Mm -hmm. in their classroom. And... We had all kinds of other cool things. The kids were in very mixed age groups. They were from 5 to 11. And um, we didn't have a science class. We hired a young scientist to come be a scientist in residence so children could actually do research alongside of the scientist. I was very interested in something called the apprenticeship model of intellectual growth. Not my idea. It's the idea of a very famous, very important Soviet researcher. What is What is that? Well, the idea, is, the idea is that when you're very good at something, and mm-hmm. you you bring a child or a novice into your orbit, 
you they help you do the thing you're doing now a lot of non-industrial societies use this as a fundamental method of of bringing kids up so in a very famous paper well i don't know if it's very famous it's a very wonderful paper um mm -hmm. uh in, done in a rural area of mexico um women who weave very beautifully and very complex um uh products the girls in their community start weaving with them and they act as apprentices so at first they do very little they hold the end of the thread or they push the pedal but as they get better and better they take on more and more of the activity and a soviet psychologist named vygotsky described this in intellectual growth as scaffolding you keep asking a younger child or a less able person to do a little more than they think they can do but not necessarily the whole thing it would take me too long to explain the whole idea behind it, okay. but, yeah, but that's I would just say simply that we thought that a lot of the time kids learn best when they're doing something interesting alongside of a, a skilled older person. And the question was, what is it teachers do best that kids are apprenticing themselves to? And the answer is, in theory, teachers what teachers are good at is learning new things. So kids learn how to learn at the side in, in, of expert learners yes in in india we have the we had this system before the western education system came in it was called gurukula vidya Pyasam, which which it which is essentially the same thing you learn from your teacher who is who is an expert in something well that's great and but the key is you and the teacher have to be do, making things that matter to you both because key mm -hmm. to apprenticeship is that the the woman weaving the beautiful fabric she needs the little girl to do a good job so there's a great investment in succeeding in your work and a, a beloved colleague of mine actually I just wrote an op-ed with her in the Washington Post her name is Catherine Snow at Harvard University she many many years ago a thousand years ago when I was a graduate student wrote papers about the way in which mothers in particular but it could be dads too um, they talk to their child in a way that scaffolds the child's language. And without any effort, you don't have to be highly educated, it's just a natural instinct for most mothers, you scaffold your child's talking the way those weavers scaffolded their the little girl's capacity to weave, and the way a good scientist in a lab gets the young, the older, the older scientist, the master scientist, the professor or whatever, um, gets the younger scientists to work alongside of them and and increasingly become capable of being the master scientists themselves. Master is maybe not a good word anymore to use. Maybe I regret that word, but the expert scientist. Do you think any other subjects should be included in basic elementary schools or uh, our, in our education system? Like for my personal opinion is like we're never taught finances and we are just thrown out into the world and we sort of figure it out on the way. And I really think it, it is one of those subjects we should be, we should be taught all along our education, uh, all along our education. But uh, do you think any other subjects or something else important that should be taught to children from a young age? No, fewer subjects. We should do fewer subjects and do a better job of oh, them. Okay. <laughs> Um, I don't think we should teach finances. Uh, I love this conversation. I've had it with so many people. I, I respect your opinion, but um, you know, one of the problems, at least in the United States, is that there's only so much kids can do and do well, or teachers can do and do well. They're only in school for like seven hours a day, and they're kids. They need to play. They need to unwind. They need to help out with their families. So it's not reasonable. I mean, what you get if you add too many things into the curriculum is a lot of kids doing doing a lot of things not very well. So mm -hmm. the reason that experimental school I was involved with kept our list very short was we thought if kids could do these few things really well, if they really knew how to engage in great conversations, if they really loved reading, if they really loved designing experiments, and they felt comfortable with numbers. Let's just leave it at that. And they knew how to collaborate. Uh, uh, someone at, a, at um, what's it called? IBM once, I was giving a talk at, at a place where there are a lot of IBM employees and a, a man 
actually, by the way, also from India, came up to me and said, well, isn't the most important thing is to learn how to be an autodidact, teach yourself something new. Um, and I totally agreed with him, but I also think it's important to learn with other people. Uh, but I, that would be my list. I think if you could do those things really well, all the things you might need to learn later in your life, like how to manage your finances. I mean, how most people who know how to teach themselves things can learn how to do that when they need to. Um, I really love that, Vic. Uh, and I really emphasize on that too, of being a lifelong learner, how that benefits you and how it just expands your world. And I think that's part of the reason after after getting more responsibilities, adults numb down a bit because they lose this learning capacity or they lose that sense of awe in their life. Oh, so that's a really great new area of research, the awe. Mm -hmm. I can't get into it and I don't know much about it, but I love it. And I encourage any of your listeners who are intrigued by what you said to, to look into that work. So that's, I mean, the thing about the word lifelong learner, I, I never use it. And I'll tell you why. I don't know about okay. any, where you live. But in this country, I've never been into a school. I'm working on a new book about kindergartens across the United States. So I've been, to, I spent the whole year visiting kindergartens and schools all over the country. And almost every single school had a plaque up somewhere, a mission statement that said, we want to be lifelong learners. But I'm a researcher, so I go into every classroom and I think, where do I see them doing that, cultivating lifelong learning? So I agree with you totally, 100%. That's the key thing to cultivate in school. But it doesn't happen unless you actually actively cultivate it. And you can't do that and teach all those other things too. It's actually really hard to cultivate a, a hunger for learning. So if you took that seriously and that was your measure of a good education, you would, you, the teacher, the principal, whatever, the board of ed would stop doing a lot of other things in order to make sure that was really, that kids were really acquiring that. It doesn't just come if, if on the, you know, with 15 minutes of recess, it, it takes mm -hmm. a, a really, um, it takes cultivation in the classroom. Uh, how do you think all these new tech, AI, virtual reality, all that's going to affect our education system or, or curiosity? I have no idea. I just can't uh, Have you thought about it? Up. What? Have you thought about it? Oh, my God, constantly. But I, <laughs> you know, my new, my new motto for myself is a knowledgeable person is someone who knows when they don't know enough to have an opinion. <laughs> And I don't know <laughs> about AI. Um, you know, you can't be a college professor right now. And I just came from a workshop about how to use chat GPT. And when I got mm -hmm. home, my husband said, oh, so now you want to cheat too? I don't want to cheat, <laughs> but I would like to use chat GPT to teach myself things. Um, yeah. And I do want to know it, what it can be used for productively. But I can't. That's like a calculator, that. isn't it? No. Like, I mean, first when, No. Go, okay. go on, you tell me. What were you going to say? No, I was thinking at first when when people use, thought of using calculators in academics, there were a lot of opposition to it, right? But the the thing is, these are all just tools that we should use. And it just makes us better, in my opinion. I don't think that's going to turn out to be true from what I've learned, from the talks I've attended and the articles I've read about um this current wave of AI, I, I, there's a wonderful book. I think the guy's last name is Bascom called super intelligence. I'm looking for mm -hmm. it on my bookshelf, but I don't see it right now. It's sort of terrifying, but it's, you would love it actually. I can tell from okay. talking to you. Um, but it's about what this new era of artificial intelligence means for humans. I mean, I was going to say before, based on what you were talking about, about updates, because you were making a parallel between the infant and a computer. Um, so far, I don't think a computer knows what it feels like. I don't know that computers have any feelings yet, but I think that the feeling of excitement that a child or an adult has when they don't know something that they want to know and they think they're going to be able to know it, 
you know, because I always say it's like eating. It's wonderful to be hungry if you know you're going to be able to eat. Then that little time mm-hmm. of hunger is wonderful. Um, it's not wonderful if you're never if you think you won't be able to eat. Then it's horrible. So that's why kids who are curious but no one supports it or encourages it or gives them resources. Why they? That's one reason kids stop being curious. It's like you stop being hungry if no one gives you any food eventually. Um, but on the other hand, um, you, uh, well, so that's all. So it feels kind of good to be hungry when you know you're going to get food. And it feels kind of good not to know something if you know you're going to be able to find it out. Um, and that feeling, which is very visceral, you must know it. I can tell just by the fact that you do this oh, yeah. podcast and everything. And I know it. And lots of people, a lot of scientists know that feeling. It's so exciting. To, you're going to get the answer to your question. Lots of kids have that feeling, almost all of them when they're two or three. Um, as far as I know, AI doesn't have that feeling. But that mm-hmm. doesn't mean that someday that won't be programmable. And so I don't think it's like a calculator. I think it's way more powerful and way more like the human mind. I could be wrong, though. I, I really barely know anything so far. Uh, we are all addicted to the, getting those new neural connections in our brain. Uh, but judging by the way, everything is growing exponentially. Uh, I don't know how much. I, th- I think it's very much within our reach, especially with... Uh, uh, Elon Musk's neural link and everything coming up where we, where we are connecting our brain. And it's, it's basically, if you, if you just zoom, zoom in on things, it's just information. It's just, uh, we'll the see. way that you define, <laughs> the way you define, way we define consciousness, which is still another big question. Yes, it is. Uh, but, but information processing or information transfer is growing it would be a really interesting time to live and find out that's true uh what what what's your idea about specialization is it is it is it good for a person because specialization might wane your curiosity because i see in that creativity happens when you connect the dots and when you have more or less a polymath mind meaning Mm. the knowledge of a lot of topics and and our world is more or less focused in specialization and um, does that affect curiosity or is it good having a a, a really wide open mind in that sense or uh, or does specialization yeah, kill curiosity about that no i don't think it's either i mean some people are obsessed their whole lives with one topic but they can't get enough mm-hmm. of it and and they learn a lot and they do great things i mean um and other people, I mean, there's a, there are words for this. There's the, in the literature, it's diversive versus specific. But extreme diversive curiosity means you're so curious about so many things that you're like the two-year-old your whole life. You're jumping around from one thing to another, and you never acquire expertise or deep knowledge. That's not that good. And if you were too specific, you'd be so narrow that you'd sort of, you'd be very limited in your life experience. As you said, you wouldn't be able to make connections across domains. But most people are some weird combination. And I I don't know. I I don't really... I I think that this is just individual difference. Seems like the... Seems like the yin and yang is a good answer. Finding the balance (laughs) in everything. Yeah. And people don't have that much choice over that. If you're someone that really only is interested in one thing, well, then that's who you... I mean, look... We're lucky that Freud was only interested in the unconscious because he created a whole new way of thinking about the human mind. Um, If he had been more superficial in his interest and less sort of demonically focused on that one thing, I mean, and you could say that about a lot. I just picked on him. I don't know why, because someone was talking about him earlier today. But think of all the people... Uh, who be, were, had such a laser-like focus on a problem or a domain, think of the artist Christo. We, we all benefited okay. from that kind of intensity, but we're not all like that. So uh, there's room for both. What pokes your interest other than curiosity, children, and your general area? Uh, cooking. <laughs> um, 
nature. I love, I mean, it's a different kind of interest. I love to do it. I, I don't learn a lot about it. I just love to be out. I love hiking. Um, well, sadly for me, politics interests me a lot. I mean, um, yeah, we, we should be aware. Uh, I'm more than aware. I'm mildly obsessed. But uh, also, I mean, I love literature. And it was very related to me to psychology. I love reading you know, I love gossip. I love people. I love their lives. I love literature because you're not just learning about the characters. You're learning about the mind of the author. I'm reading Stephen King's new novel right now. It's called Holly. And um, it's kind of creepy and wonderful. But I, because I'm writing a book myself right now and because Stephen King wrote a wonderful book about writing years ago called On Writing, I find as I'm reading his novel, as much as I love the plot and the characters, I also am thinking a lot about Stephen King, like, oh, how did he make that decision? And how does he do that when he writes? And I wonder why he chose to end that sentence that way. So for me, novels, well, I just, they offer me so many riches. Yeah. Exactly. I remember reading, like, opening a book, you are getting into the mind of another person. Exactly. Exactly. And so I just love that. And... Uh, because I'm, a, I, I write, I wouldn't call myself a writer, but I, I actually, I'm working, uh, you said six books, I'm working on my 10th book and I still have so much to learn about how to write. And so for me, there's an added delight that I'm getting inside the mind of a writer. Like that's the mind I want to get inside of. If parents have to bring up a, re a curious child, yes. what would, what would your advice be to them that's on how to be a question. good parent? Okay, I'll, that's a great last question, so I'll answer it. Um, first of all, and this is hard, this is a tall order, uh, be curious yourself. So we know from research that children are deeply influenced by the curiosity of people around them. I had a student who did a study of this, so modeling curiosity really matters. Asking questions yourself and being interested in new information, all of that affects the child. But the second thing, along with that, is even if that's hard to achieve, because if you don't feel curious, it's hard to make yourself be curious. Some people are just not very curious, but they still might want their children to be curious. Um, and there, it's kind of easy, actually. Um, encourage them to ask questions. Answer their questions. Ask them questions. Um, encourage them to pursue what interests them. Uh, so that you take that spark that's there in the two-year-old and you fan the flames of it um, mm -hmm. and give them time to pursue what interests them and to explore what they want. You know, I used to make this joke. There's this old, in the research that I was talking about before with the vests, one of the things the author talk, authors talk about are the kinds of conversations parents have with kids that they call episodes of intellectual search where kids are wondering about things or trying to understand something or find things out and plastering their parents with questions and the parents are kind of talking about things with their kids. And they found that those conversations are most likely to happen when uh, at the dinner table when no one's doing anything. No one's trying to get anything done or get rushing to the car or finish a chore. And I developed this idea that ideas love leisure. And... Um, that just means that you can't really encourage, foster intellectual growth or curiosity if you don't give kids time to just sort of hang around and noodle around and play and talk and daydream um, because that's sort of the, that's the way that people um, nourish their intellectual appetites. And I also remember uh, reading it some ways like, uh, children imitate and that's the best way and so if you if they find you reading a book or playing a violin they tend to imitate they don't like obeying to what they what you say to them but they imitate and they, that's how they become and I, I found that really interesting too it is interesting I would just say to parents that they might not imitate you because they might have different interests than you and that's okay too you want your kid to be interested not necessarily interested in what you're interested in I mean, it's up to them whether to imitate or not, but That's it's right. for That's you true. to give them that That's image. Uh, the last question. Okay. If, if people were to read one book, 
what would that be which is your favorite book or an eye opening book that changed you um this book why we are polarized by Ezra Klein i mean i could give you 20 books 30 books um Wuthering Heights Anna Karenina uh Middle March but uh of con- new books that have really had a profound impact on me Ezra Klein's book why we are polarized is an amazing book okay and that would be a really good ending point or something for our listeners yes and it was really good talking to you susan today and exploring the various aspects of curiosity and how it affects us humans and um where can people find you on your work um or well or they have to I, get in touch with you yeah they uh, i teach at williams college um and i have an email there and a you know all my contact information so that's the best way people can reach me my most recent book was called the intellectual lives of children and it was published by Harvard University Press and as i said i'm working on a new book about kindergarten uh in the united states but they have to wait a while for that cuz i have to finish writing it that was professor susan engel sharing her thoughts on how curiosity shapes us as children and as how we grow up and how we can use it to change our lives hope you guys gained something from the episode again if you liked it don't forget to like share subscribe and comment see you on the next episode